Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Is a man not entitled to take a break from creating comic book videos for the YouTubes? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I have been gone for a week, and it seems like everybody is panicking. Like, I am dead. No, I am not dead. Uh, I need a break from doing this just like everybody else. And so I took my break for a week, and we are back to making videos. And in this video, we are covering the story where Dormammu becomes the Herald of, of Galactus, almost said Doctor Strange, and it's actually amazing. So here's a funny thing. When it comes to Doctor Strange as a comic book character, for the average person, it usually seems like it's not worth the price of admission, right? Where it's just kind of like, meh, you know, and I'll go do something else instead uh it, it really seems to feel like that like when it when it comes because the doctor strange line of comics really are for just a particular kind of comic book fan now if you like magic and mysticism of course it's for you but if you're not a huge fan of that you don't really want to have a whole lot to do with it and that's kind of one of the things that that mark wade sort of hits on to a degree right like he picks up the story and he's just kind of like he's he has doctor strange sort of musing to himself right and it's just kind of like i've pretty much done everything and so i'm bored now <laughs> because in reality that's the nature of doctor strange comics right he's also he's, he's one of these weird characters he's the master of the mystic arts and it's kind of like i'm i know the most about magic you know than anybody else in the in the universe but it's interesting because the, the question he kind of asks here is like is there no real adventure left anymore like is there really nothing for me to do like is this is this kind of it like i'm just going to be sitting in the house watching the view and waiting for something to happen and then he's suddenly met by the arrival of a guy named zolaz now here's a cool thing zolaz is a guy who comes from a planet that galactus has basically visited right like he's part of a group called the xerax the xeraxians and and the result is that Galactus is literally going to consume their world. And so what his people ended up doing was that as a mage himself, they basically took all of their energies, dumped it into him. And the result is that he's been sent here now because when they scanned through the mind of Galactus to figure out what his weakness was, the only thing they could find was Earth. Now, this is why things are interesting because Zola shows up here believing that Earth has someone powerful enough to defeat Galactus. And they do. I mean, you got the Molecule Man, Owen Reese. Uh, you've got Franklin Richards, who's really more akin to Galactus. Like they're really more counterparts now, you know, in these days than they are like, you know, one being more powerful than the other. Oh, well, I guess the future version of Franklin is basically like a counterpart to Galactus. But still, like, as we know as the reader, the reason why Galactus sees Earth as a weakness is because of, like, the totality of the heroes on it. And that's what you would need. Like, you would literally need, like, all the heroes on Earth to band together, fly to the other side of the universe, and, like, defeat Galactus, right? But, like, they're not going to because it's just the natural role of Galactus. And that's what Zolas doesn't get, is literally he just kind of starts, like, getting into this fight with Doctor Strange and, of course, basically starts using his abilities to, like, like absorb magical energy to like absorb all of Doctor Strange's duplicates into himself. It's really one of these things where it's like every step that Doctor Strange takes, this guy's powerful enough to overcome. And of course, that leads into him discovering like the various books of Doctor Strange and then absorbing all their knowledge. Now, I want to talk about this for a second. When it comes to magic in Marvel Comics, there was the way that things used to be, and then there's essentially kind of like the way things are now, right? So the way that things used to be is that you had essentially just like ambient energy out there. Anybody who who, who has the power to tap into to like reality warping is harnessing the fundamental energies of the universe is basically what it is right so like if if the universe is clay then they're essentially like tapping into and manipulating that clay is, is literally what they're doing when it comes to like telepathy it's tapping into the ambient energies basically tapping into the ability to access the astral plane more or less you know access the, re the realm where like thoughts go to as they pass from one location to the next and then in turn you know harness those thoughts to do whatever it is that you want to do control them wipe them out of somebody's head whatever the case is then there's the way that they exist now now, right so like magic was it was just kind of energy that was there and you could manipulate it in ultimates volume 2 issue number 100 by al ewing what he said was that magic actually never used to exist it wasn't until the various you know the multiverse was destroyed and recreated and destroyed and recreated when it was destroyed and remade for the fifth time that that version of eternity had basically like brought magic into the main marvel universe and said okay magic is here now and people can use it of course that multiverse was destroyed and recreated again but the fact remains like that's when magic started being brought in and people had the ability to access it so we we know like of all the different versions of the multiverse that have ever existed there was never a doctor strange until you got to the fifth version again it's, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a historical thing there but the fact remains that what you have here in this day and age is essentially just like a wide array of different people tapping into a wide array of different powers now that was always the case but having somebody come along who's more powerful than doctor strange really highlights two things one that of course there are people out there who can use magic in a more adept way than doctor strange and two doctor strange is the sorcerer supreme in name only now that's 
that's the indication that's put off here. That's the, the basis behind like what's being told because basically this guy's kind of like, you have all these forms of magical energy here. Like you have all these things that you could use. Why don't you just use them all? Now, what this does is it kind of moves into the second part of that discussion and says, okay, the difference here is that where Doctor Strange could absorb all these forms of energy into himself, all these magical principles, and then use them for his own ends, who knows what kind of chaos would, would erupt because of it. And so that's the, the true nature of Doctor Strange. Yes, he could acquire absolute power. Is it a good idea? No. Now, again, this kind of flies in the face of a lot of stories we've seen before, right? Like Doctor Strange basically going to Center's Market and then bartering 100% of his soul for 100% of his power, or at least trying. But we only know that, like, well, at least we do know, Doctor Strange only does that in like the most extreme circumstances, right? Like the Beyonder comes back and wants to attack Earth. Okay, well then he'll do whatever he needs to do in order to make that happen. But under a normal circumstance, you can't do that. At the same time, it's also Zola's not really understanding the nature of Galactus. It's his role in the cosmos, right? I mean, it's just one of those things. If Galactus comes rolling up on your place and is going to start like consuming your entire planet sorry about your luck that's just the way it goes nice knowing you like it's, it's basically it you know just like flee while you can but it's the role of galactus he's a fundamental part of the a part of the universe and so again like we know that from a, a wide array of different stories but of course zolas doesn't and so basically channeling all these magical energies he literally opens a portal in the main marvel universe and whisks uh, galactus away to like the depths of the mystic realms what this means is galactus is now in the realm of like dormammu and he's in the realm of like nightmare he's in the realm of of like all these basic mystical you know these these mystical forces that are out there and there's no guess as to what like there's no telling what in the world is going to happen and that's what dr strange kind of freaks out about right like like galactus is a being of pure science right like he serves a purpose it is i am a being who travels around the cosmos and i serve two purposes the first is that i consume planets that can sustain life-sustaining energy so that the celestials cannot plant their eggs in like every single planet across the cosmos and overrun the universe uh and i also do this because i'm a gatekeeper right if i die Abraxas comes out and Abraxas will basically wipe out the entire multiverse. Those of you guys who, never, who don't know about Abraxas, he's essentially just like the like the, the representation of the multiverse's destruction, right? Like there was a story in the 2000s where, where Galactus died, um, where he was allowed to die, basically. It was kind of like, hey, look, if I die, terrible things will happen. And it was allowed to die, or he was allowed to die. And then in turn, like basically you find out that like Abraxas, this being that represents destruction in the multiverse, breaks out of this kind of prison he's always been in. And then he in turn starts traveling around like the multiverse, killing every version of Galactus that he finds. So again, it was it was kind of crazy. It was a, a pretty wonky story, but suffice it to say, Abraxas is, Abraxas is insanely powerful. Like he's, it's it's nuts how powerful he is. But to take someone like that, like Galactus, and then throw him into the, the mystic depths, there's no telling what would happen. That's exactly what Strange says. And so when he gets in there with all this magical arms and, and armory and so on and so forth, then suddenly he's met by like this giant stampede of people who are, or I guess beings who are all just fleeing for their lives because Galactus, like the first thing he does is start consuming like energy off of one of these planets. Galactus starts doing exactly what Galactus is doing. Now, here's a funny thing. Strange shows up here and says, hey, look, man, you can't necessarily do that. Now, the fact that Galactus addresses him directly is a little bit astounding, and that's kind of one of the funny things that Wade talks about here, right? Because we know from, from Marvel Comics, Galactus never usually addresses just like a, a being, like a, a normal person, because he doesn't really care. He's like, I mean, I don't, why would I care Why would I care enough to talk to you? You know, one, there's nothing you could probably tell me that would, that would interest me intellectually, right? I mean, you're no Reed Richards. And two, like, you're not really powerful enough to stop me or challenge me so why do i care but galactus literally addresses him and is like why am i here so it's just kind of like okay galactus is trying to get a feel for his surroundings trying to figure out like what's going on why he's here all that kind of good stuff not only that what's happened is he's basically been like sent to a particular place in the in the the depths of the mystic realm and then bound inside of a prison and so he has like these little small planetoids here and there but those aren't enough to do anything for him and so what he basically does is like break out of his prison and into like the greater depths then like the first person he runs into or the first thing he runs into is uh miss and hagorath now miss and hagorath is is what's referred to as the beast of pain but there's no real history to go on here because this is the first time he's ever been seen and then he dies because it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, so that guy's gone. But what this is, this is actually Mark Wade proving a very important point. When it comes to Galactus as a character, it's largely assumed he just absorbs the life, the, the ambient energies of a life-sustaining planet and then moves on. What this actually confirms is something that we, I guess maybe always kind of knew in the back of our heads, but never really thought about, that Galactus can absorb energy off of beings. And that's exactly what happens here, right? Like this beast of pain goes to attack Galactus and then basically shows him like, I have a huge amount of energy stored inside of me. And in turn, Galactus absorbs it all out of him. Now, it could very well just be that this guy's kind of
kind of like a conduit for magical energy, which means like he actually stores that energy inside of him, as opposed to being like Doctor Strange, where he just reaches out and touches it and, and, and har uh, harnesses it. It could be that way. We don't really know. But whatever the basis behind him is, all this energy that he possesses at his disposal, Galactus absorbs it. And that's when Doctor Strange begins to realize that a very dangerous thing is happening. With Galactus going through and absorbing all these magical energies that exist either in planets or in people inside this universe, that what he's basically doing is tapping into a source of energy that he's not really familiar with and that even Doctor Strange himself doesn't really know what effect it'll have, right? I mean, like what this is, is like Galactus going out. It's, it's like you going out and eating like a standard Western diet every day, right? Like 50% protein, 25% fats and like 25% carbs or something along those lines, you know, 30% fats and, and, you know, 20% carbs or whatever, whatever the case is, you going out and, and in turn, like consuming a standard Western diet and then just suddenly jumping into like a random diet, like a, like an exotic diet with no indication of what it'll do to you, right? Like it's, it's the best example I could think of, but that's basically it here is, is literally what's going on. Galactus's form is, is predicated on consuming life-sustaining energies in a universe he was born into. So he was born for that purpose. He was not born for the purpose of consuming magical energy. Who knows what kind of situation that's going to create. So of course, Doctor Strange binds Galactus and is able to do it for a pretty good chunk of time. But again, we're talking about Galactus. So the concern that he has is I'm not going to be able to keep this guy bound forever. Like eventually he's going to break out. And of course, like Galactus begins to, and then that's when his binds are reestablished again. And we're met with the arrival of Clea. Now, Clea is a character that we haven't talked about ever. And we've never had a reason to because she's never, she hasn't appeared in a very long time. <laughs> anyway, the basis behind this really actually goes into the origin of two beings, Umar and Dormammu. Now, back in the old Strange Tale comics, when, when Dormammu first popped up, what you got was the, the, the origin of his character shortly after, around that time. But you also learned about a group called the Faltine. Now, the Faltine, F-A-L-T-I-N-E. This is a group that existed in another dimension and was naturally adept at wielding magical energy. The issue is that Dormammu and Umar wanted like physical pleasures, more or less. And of of course that was kind of banished because they were beings composed of like spiritual form and so because of that they basically ended up killing uh Senefer, I think, killing their, their creator. And then in turn, they like were banished to the Dark Dimension. Now, the Dark Dimension at the time was ruled by a guy named King Olnar. He was like a warlord or something like that. Anyway, basically like Umar and Dormammu showed up in the Dark Dimension and were kind of like, okay, so like this is our place now. And using like subterfuge and being deceptive, they basically started to use King Olnar as a way to essentially like doom his own people, the Mercs. At least I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced, Mercs. I think it's M-H-U-U-R-K-S. I think it's how you pronounce it or how you spell it. But basically this was a group that like was, was a normal and inhabitant of the dark dimension and then in turn could also use magical energy what ended up happening here is that with with dormammu and umar taking over and then dormammu basically going into his faultian form which is his energy based form and then umar maintaining her human form this led to umar engaging in a affair of sorts with one of the servants of dormammu and this basically led to the birth of clea and so clea is technically the rightful heir to the throne of the dark dimension uh so think of think of like katana from mortal Kombat, basically um but she's technically the rightful heir for from, to the to the dark dimension, but she doesn't really take it because Dormammu currently rules it. So unless she was able to master, uh, I guess, muster a sizable force that was powerful enough to take out Dormammu in his own dimension, which is probably never going to happen, in turn, like she would just basically kind of reside there. Now she and Doctor Strange teamed up a couple times, and then like the second or third time it happened, they fell in love. She became a student of Doctor Strange, and then eventually he married her, and she became his wife. So now she's his ex-wife. So but basically, just take it as you know, his ex-wife is here in order to help him, which is kind of weird. But what they end up doing is basically saying like what we need is an, an, an alliance of people like we basically need an alliance of magic wielders out there some of the most powerful people in existence in order to like get rid of galactus and banish him from here and so that's when you bring in umar now umar is synonymous with deception right i mean that's the nature of her character she's the sister of dormammu it's one of these things where like she's always trying to like topple her brother and take his place or she just really kind of wants to be second place and just wants to sort of manipulate things behind the scenes her schemes and motivations really never make sense to anybody but herself and she's in insanely powerful but it's one of the funny things that we're seeing here is that like galactus is more powerful and that's kind of the cool thing is because what they're doing is they're they're literally going through and like they're like galactus is kind of being ravaged by the very energies he's consuming and so it seems like one of these things where the more energy he consumes the more it seems to consume him now the reality of this is dr strange looks at that and says no, no 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 it's not really that i mean i guess he is kind of being consumed but galactus is changing and the reason why is because galactus is actually a being of pure energy that's one of the things to bear in mind galactus doesn't 
really have a true physical form. He did at one point, but when he was born into the main Marvel Universe as Galactus, he was born as a being of pure energy. That's why it is, whenever Galactus shows up on the doorstep of a race's planet and he's going to consume their planet, he's a mirror to them, right? So like the scrolls will see a scroll version of Galactus, the Kree will see a Kree version of Galactus, but it's the outfit he wears and the fact that he's there to consume their planet that makes him so terrifying. Now, of course, we found that out in the trial of Reed Richards way back in the 1980s, whenever it was that that story came out. But the overall gist behind this is that what's happening is the normal energies that make up Galactus, the energies of a positive universe, basically like the main Marvel universe, are slowly being replaced by these exotic energies he's consuming, right? So it's like having a bottle of water and then dropping some iodine inside, right? Like some dye of some kind. It's going to start to permeate out and then eventually change the water if you put enough in there. And that's what's happening here. Galactus is essentially being poisoned by magical energy. And so what ends up happening is Doctor Strange basically says, okay, fine. In this case, like we can't have you running around and consuming like all these life-sustaining planets because we have no idea what effect it's going to have on you like in the extreme if you get to the wrong one so i will do two things one i will basically become your new herald go out and try to find a planet that is uninhabited and two i will try to make sure the uninhabited planet i find will keep you sustained but will not continue to poison you the way that like all these other planets have been consuming you and that's why it's kind of a crazy thing because galactus is just sort of falling apart more or less <laughs> and so what ends up happening here is you end up having like dormammu who's basically basically visited like by Misnaha Gorath and it's kind of like hey look like there's this crazy powerful being who's consuming everything you have to stop him and that's when we end up finding out Dormammu's already aware of Galactus like he's already aware of the power Galactus has and he's already aware of like what he's capable of and like he's already making moves against Galactus to be able to like defeat him and that's kind of the crazy thing here is because where Doctor Strange is sort of hopping around and going from world to world trying to find different locations you have like the forces of uh, of, of Umar who are traveling around and they actually end up running up on Nightmare now Nightmare is actually a cool guy so in Marvel Comics, the way this works is that whenever you lay down and go to sleep, if you have a nightmare, those nightmares feed the actual nightmare dimension, which powers the guy nightmare. But they're also there's also a potential to, for them to be kind of fed back to you in the extreme. And that's one of the reasons why nightmares is, is really considered to be like an immortal and indestructible being. So long as beings exist and they can dream, then nightmare can exist because they will have nightmares. The only way to really to, to get nightmare to a point where he can be defeated is to wipe out all sentient life. But you'd have to essentially blink out the universe which would kill him anyway um because you i mean literally it's it's the dreams of like all beings in existence and then potentially the dreams in the future so like or at least the nightmares of people in the future it's really weird and it's really finicky but basically if they got nightmare on their side well it may not necessarily be enough to like overpower galactus in his entirety and like destroy him because he's just so amped up with all this magical power it would certainly be enough to create like some havoc and so where basically doctor strange ends up finally locating a planet and then grabs galactus and brings him back what they end up finding out is there's all these small little instances of people getting in their way of trying to like slow Galactus down and eventually he ends up having to invoke his power and start attacking these guys which of course begins to depower him a little bit more now eventually we end up finding out that like once they get to this planet and like Galactus goes to consume it immediately right off the bat we end up finding out something is wrong that this planet has been tainted and that's when we end up finding out Dormammu is the one behind it that Dormammu is the new herald of Galactus and that Dormammu tampered the tamper with this planet so that when Galactus went to consume it it would amp him up but it would also twist him and screw him up and basically become kind of a, a servant to Dormammu but at the same time like Dormammu becoming a herald of Galactus. The other half of this is that when Doctor Strange sits down and says okay so like something else has to be going on here right like yes Dormammu is very very powerful but like by himself at least that seems to be the indication by himself Dormammu is not necessarily powerful enough to stop Galactus. Now we actually don't know this we can't really argue either way because the reality of this is that they've never met and they're two beings from two distinctly different dimensions. I mean I guess you can find some way to kind of you know move the pieces around and cook the books so that some argument can be made but the reality is that like we've never seen this happen before we've never seen a full-on conflict between Galactus and Dormammu and so it's really kind of creating a narrative and creating a standard and saying okay so like de you know definitively Dormammu is not more power is no more powerful than Galactus right like there's these like Galactus is more powerful than Dormammu essentially like that's really kind of what's being said here and that the other the other way to kind of manipulate this the other kind of power that was needed came from Mephisto as it always does but basically the the gist behind this is that the alliance that was formed between Dormammu and Mephisto, that what this would basically mean is that Dormammu would conquer planets and continue to expand his his reign, his kingdom, right? Like outside of the dark dimension and into other places in the mystic realms and then like expand his kingdom. But every single world that is consumed and the people who perish basically expand Mephisto's realm. Now, this, this is kind of the crazy thing. Mephisto doesn't really take souls in the traditional sense. Mephisto's verse, like his, his section of hell is, is essentially like 
expanded by people who sold their souls for some particular deed, right? Like whether it was money or like success or power or something along those lines. But they basically bargained with Mephisto, not realizing that like when everything was done, Mephisto would take their soul to his realm. Uh, that's that's really what his version of hell is consigned for. It's not just everyone who dies just automatically goes to where Mephisto is at. Uh, presumably it's those individuals that he, he probably made packs with, which he could. I mean, presumably Mephisto could use his almost infinite power to show up and basically appear to every single person who's basically dying on the planet at the same time and saying like, you know, I can, I can do this. I can basically, you know, I can save you. Uh, all you have to do is say yes. And they say, okay, like they, they basically make a deal with Mephisto. And then when they all end up dying anyway, and they show up in his realm and he's like, you know, they're like, well, I thought you were going to save us. And it's like, I did, I saved you for my realm, you know, and then just bam, leave him there or something along those lines. I mean, presumably he could do that. I mean, he's almost infinitely powerful, but that's basically what's going on. Dormammu and Mephisto are now working in tandem together. And that Dormammu is now the herald of Galactus, taking him from planet to planet and basically showing him all the best worlds to feed on, presumably all the worlds that Dormammu wants to go after. But it's actually pretty pretty beast. Like, I'm pretty excited about this. Like, I want to see them fight. That's what I want to see. Like, Galactus versus Dormammu. Okay, so continuing on with our videos on Doctor Strange, here's the thing. I didn't even realize it was going to do that well, right? It was just like Doctor Strange or it was like Galactus meets Dormammu. And then you guys went crazy on that video, which I guess is something everybody always wanted to see was like Doctor Strange meeting Dormammu. Like what happens when these two beings of crazy power encounter one another? Uh, in this video, they fight and it's the coolest thing. It's, it's amazing. I am, I am so excited about this. Okay, so initially this picks up in Mephisto's realm, right? And for those of you guys who were just now kind of joining this, essentially, Galactus had been banished to the realm of magic, right? So like all these magical worlds and things like that. Literally, people were panicking and fleeing, right? Like Doctor Strange went there to try to solve the problem, but couldn't really deal with it. And then halfway through all this madness, Dormammu had like basically bombarded Galactus with essentially what was like dark magical energy and kind of transformed him into what Dormammu considered to be a herald. And so we ended up finding out Mephisto had basically a pact with uh, with Dormammu insofar as as long as Galactus was in that realm, all those individuals, all those beings who would die would be sent to Mephisto realm. And then of course, with all those beings basically being killed off, it could allow Dormammu to, to spread his influence outside his own dimension and into like the greater magical dimension as a whole. And so what this does is get a little more nuanced and a little more into that. The funny thing about this is that with Doctor Strange trying to rationalize with Dormammu and saying, hey, look, man, you have no idea what you're doing. The magical barriers are basically being weakened. One of the things that Marvel's established over the years in their, their comics when it comes to magical energy is there's this kind of invisible barrier that separates the magical dimensions from like the regular Marvel universe, right? So, I mean, it's, it's almost like closing a door, right? I mean, it's what keeps the dimension of Dormammu, the dark dimension, from just like flowing over into the main universe, right? It's like a, it's like a kind of invisible gate that keeps everything separated and everything locked away. What's happening is that with Galactus's presence in this universe, it's essentially opened a door. And by virtue of doing that, allows magical energy to flow into the main Marvel universe and then disrupt everything accordingly. So science really kind of goes out the door. And in fact, science and magic are sort of blending together. Now, we know that happens in places like Asgard, the difference is that it's kind of been mastered and it's been contained. Here, in, in the main Marvel Universe, none of that's happening. It's just kind of running amok unchecked with no one really understanding how to do it. But the cool thing about this is Dormammu's argument is, I can use Galactus as a means to essentially walk through this doorway and enter into the main Marvel Universe. And we know that if he successfully did that, it would be a catastrophe, right? Because like, one of the things that has been established over the course of, of Doctor Strange's comics in Marvel is that if Dormammu at full strength were to enter into the main Marvel Universe, pretty much nobody could stop him because his powers just so extreme and absolute that it's almost completely immutable and indestructible. Now, that's within his own realm, the Dark Dimension. Even showing up in the main Marvel Universe, it would be extreme. But the funny thing is that Mark Wade kind of rebuffs that, right? And we'll actually find out why here in a little bit, but he kind of rebuffs that and actually says it's not really that way when it comes to Dormammu. But the funny thing about this is that with everything happening the way that it is, the magical barrier basically flowing into the scientific barrier is creating all kinds of problems and all kinds of chaos. And that's the funny thing is because Dormammu is by his definition an exceedingly arrogant guy. And so when he looks at Galactus and he says, I've imbued him with dark energy. He's now my thrall. I control him. And then in turn orders Galactus, Galactus blows him off. And he's, he's literally like, I'm nobody's herald. Now, one of the questions people would ask is why hasn't Galactus acknowledged Dormammu up to this point? Well, remember when it comes to Galactus as a being, if he doesn't really consider you someone of significance, he'll just ignore you. And he just won't pay any attention to you, right? I mean, you're an ant in the cosmic scope of things. So, you know, why would you pay attention to the going ons of an ant? That's how he functions. But it's kind of crazy here because when Dormammu literally powers up all of his energy, 
energy and then goes to attack Galactus, Galactus absorbs all the power of Dormammu into himself and then absorbs Do uh, Dormammu himself into Galactus and then goes forward as like this holy, holy powerful entity. And that's the fight. It happens that fast. And I know it seems a little anticlimactic, but this is a powerful statement because what it's saying is that even in his own realm, even in the Dark Dimension, the power of Dormammu is dwarfed by the power of Galactus. And that's bold. That's a bold statement to make. People will look at that and say, that's ridiculous. There's no way Galactus could overpower Dormammu. But that's kind of a silly statement to make because they've never fought before. So there's no reason to believe that couldn't be the case. Galactus is right now in possession of all his power cosmic and all the, all the power of, of Dormammu. It's crazy. Like he's he's on he's on a, a scale of power that he's never experienced before. And even Doctor Strange is like, so we're basically screwed. Like there's really nothing we can do here. Like we're talking about a guy who already had the power of Galactus, right? Like the ability to like create life and all that kind of stuff. And now he's got all the all the magical energy of Dormammu, which amplifies his power even more. It's crazy how how capable and how powerful he's become here. Now the other half of this is that realizing what it was Dormammu said in making reference to Mephisto, Doctor Strange takes off and says, "Fine, we have to go find Mephisto. We have to talk to him and figure out what's going on." And when the two of them talk together, the discussion of Doctor Strange, or at least the argument he makes here, is, "Look, the the boundaries between magic and science are going away, and is permeating the entirety of the universe, which includes your realm. So it's only a matter of time before your realm will be subjugated by whatever all this chaos is that happens to unfold. Uh, so either you can be on board, or you can perish with everybody else." And Mephisto's response is, "No, my realm is fine." Now, of course, the way this is done, it's obvious Mephisto realizes his realm would be in jeopardy, like his dimension would probably perish, but he doesn't side with Doctor Strange immediately. Instead, what he says is, I will free Clea and Umar, the sister of uh, the sister of Dormammu. I will do that, but so long as you make a bargain with me. Now, this is dangerous because remember, when it comes to Mephisto, he takes the souls of those he makes bargains with and is usually a catch of some sort, right? So like, let's say for example, that you are a person who like lost your legs. You would say, if you give me back my legs, I will serve as like your ghost rider or something along those lines. Mephisto would say, okay, I will give you your legs back and, and you can be my ghost rider. And so he'll give you your legs and then he'll in turn, he'll take away your ability to feel them, right? So like you have your legs back, but you still can't use them. Or he would give you your legs back and then take away your arms or something along those lines. There's a catch to it. And so basically there's no real benefit for you to be in league with him. And then when you die, he gets your soul. So with Dr. Strange, he basically says, okay, I will make a pact with you. You can call me for, you can call me up for, for a favor at some point, And I will be bound to you to fulfill this, this, this need that you have, this favor, whatever it is that you ask of me, I will do it. Just free Clea and free Umar. And the reason why is because with Clea being the ex-wife of Dr. Strange and Umar being the sister of Dormammu, they're exceedingly powerful. And Dr. Strange needs all the powerful allies at his side that he can possibly get. And that's what he does. He sends, you know, Umar and, and Clea into the, you know, really into like the, the magical dimensions and says, get as many allies as you possibly can. They end up going to visit, uh, visit Nightmare. They end up going to visit Despair, two insanely powerful beings, right? Like Nightmare's power is extremely extreme I and mean, he's powered by like all the nightmares of sentient beings right so his power is extreme and where previously he ignored Clea and Umar and said like I'm not having anything to do with this when like Dormammu as powerful as he is was defeated the nightmares like okay I'm on your side and that's a testament to how powerful Dormammu is that's one of the things to bear in mind among those who are familiar with like the magical side of things Dormammu's terrifying because like his power is so incredibly vast and so so wild and so in addition to that you have Doctor Strange who actually goes and pleads to eternity and to uh, uh, to the living tribunal and this is kind of cool because when 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 situations like this happen uh, the argument of dr strange is as a living tribunal you exist to maintain a cosmic balance eternity like you're basically the like the representation of all life in the universe of like the entire space that the universe makes up you guys have to aid us and the response of eternity is no i will continue on no matter what form the universe takes magic will permeate into science and everything will go into disarray but my form will still remain there's no reason for me to act here and the living tribunal judges in agreement and he says, this is just the new cosmic order of things that magic will blend with science. And then like, that'll be it. And like, it'll find a new harmony, but there's no imbalance here. There's no reason for me to judge. Uh, therefore we are both out of this. And this is a huge blow for Dr. Strange because if either eternity or even the living tribunal stepped in, fight would be over like that. It'd be done. It would be just a wave of their hands. Galactus goes back to normal to the way he was before. He gets whisked back into the main Marvel universe and the story ends. And that's basically it. But the fact that they choose not to act means that essentially that like, as, as far as like the magic nature of things and even the universe itself they're screwed like they're basically kind of on their own and and seemingly there's no real way for them to overcome this or at least that appears to be the case and so what dr strange ends up doing is actually calling together pretty much a, a whole host of the various magical and, and and demonic entities out there right so you've got damon hellstrom you've got brother voodoo you've got magic you've got uh scarlet witch we never really talked about damon hellstrom he's basically the son of the devil he was actually kind of a cool character for a little while Marvel just never really knew what to do with him outside of his first appearances but basically it's all these various magical 
beings that are out there. And Doctor Strange's response is, okay, well, I mean, we know we're not necessarily as equipped as we could be, right? Because I mean, despite the power they have here, even with Scarlet Witch, she's not channeling the power of Cthone. She's not like House of M House of M level. But what you have here is, is where Doctor Strange is like, okay, so this is all we have. Um, then that's fine. We'll do the best that we can. He basically gets a response from like everyone, you know, where he's kind of like, okay, our numbers are not that high, but we, you know, I kind of wish they could be. Uh, then it's like, okay, well then allow us to, to help. So what we get here are the Inhumans. We get, uh, we get Valkyrie. Remember a lot of this, uh, this actually takes place, uh, takes place before the War of Realms. We have Nova. Uh, we have like basically all these different beings like the silver surfer gladiator of the shiar imperial guard uh you've got like oh like the incredible hulk you got pretty much all the heavy hitters in Marvel. You've got a lot of heavy hitters, like a lot of powerful guys here. I think even Captain Universe is here. And so Doctor Strange is actually kind of heartened by this, you know, because it's like, okay, so like we have a chance to basically win here. Like we've got some very, very powerful people. Hopefully it'll be enough. We stand a much better chance than we did before. So when the question's asked, what do we do? His response is keep a tight formation, keep the faith, and above all, do not die. Okay, so continuing on with Doctor Strange, uh, this is, I mean, this story's getting nuts. <laughs> See, here's the thing, guys, like, here's here's why this is such a big deal, right? Because you look at someone like Galactus and you say, okay, so Galactus has the power cosmic. What does that mean? Well, the power cosmic is just kind of a hand-wavy explanation for why Galactus can do what he does, right? It's basically the power of a universe, more or less. I mean, he was born from a previous universe into the new one, and he's just kind of been around ever since. But then you have someone like Dormammu, and Dormammu is part of the fall team, I think it is, is, is like crazy crazy powerful, right? I mean, it's one of those things like in the old Doctor Strange stories, and, and a lot has changed since then, but in the old Doctor Strange stories, it was largely st it was largely assumed, and then I guess more recently verified, that if Dormammu ever showed up in the main Marvel universe at full power, like virtually nobody would be able to stop him. Now, this really seems to answer that question and say like Galactus could basically defeat him, Galactus could be the one to stop him, could overpower him. Again, like, I think it's kind of debatable. I mean, it's, you know, I, I love the way the story's being written and I like what Mark Waid's doing, but I mean, it's Dormammu though. I mean, you know, like Galactus is powerful, but like Dormammu is exceedingly powerful. And so with this story unfolding the way it is, what this ends up doing is it actually ends up picking up with Satanish. Now Satanish is a character, he's appeared like 50 some odd times, maybe like 55, 56 times. He hasn't shown up a whole lot of times in uh, in, in Marvel comics. He debuted back in, in 1968 with Doctor Strange uh, number 174. Um, I've heard tale that like he was was referenced about two or three years before that. I don't know if it's true or not. I, mean, I was never really that consistent of a reader with Doctor Strange. So I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't know if that's true or not. Uh, and I'm not going to go back and read, you know, all the Doctor Strange comics from 1966 to 1968 to find out. It's not really that important to me. But Satanish was created by Dormammu. And the idea behind this is that Satanish is, is one of those characters that Doctor Strange can invoke. Now, this is one of the things you have to understand when it comes to Stephen Strange. With his powers, of course, he has no real power unto himself. He invokes the powers of others. But the issue with Satanish unlike the Vashanti or unlike uh, like Sidorak or any of those other demons that he basically summons energy from, Satanish is is like a benevolent being. Right? I'm, I'm sorry, no, he's, he's a malevolent being. There we go. Not benevolent. He's kindly and a good guy. <laughs> he's, a, he's a malevolent force. And so if Doctor Strange summons the power of Satanish, what it does is it would open a means by which Satanish could show up on Earth and then he would try to. He would try to show up here and then unleash all kinds of problems. I mean, there have been groups like the Sons of Satanish which are like a cult from back in the day. Uh, but you're talking about an exceedingly powerful being here. Now, if this was any other situation, I would just kind of roll with it and say, wow, this is incredible. But because of the fact that you're talking about Galactus having already defeated Dormammu, who in turn created Satanish, there's no real reason to, to, to see this as kind of like a shocking thing. I mean, it is shocking insofar as if you're a reader of Doctor Strange, Galactus is basically just like steamrolling the most powerful characters that we've ever seen in a Doctor Strange comic shy of like the the cosmic entities and like the living tribunal, right? So like all the demonic forces that are out there, Galactus is just like wrecking them all, right? So, I mean, this this is almost kind of like a mini Doctor Strange version of like Secret Wars, right? Like the Beyonders show up and just kill all the cosmic entities. That's really what this is. Now, this doesn't have the buildup to it, so it's not nearly as grandiose in scope, but that's basically what's happening here. Uh, and that's why people are really starting to freak out and really starting to panic because when Satanish seems to be winning, Galactus suddenly just absorbs all of his energy 
energy unto himself and then consume Satanish. And when that happens, there's no one really left to stop him, right? Like, Satanish was kind of like their ace in the hole, at least for all the superheroes who were there. Now, of course, Doctor Strange has been out of the picture for the most part, and, and you know, following up from the last issue, we know that it's, it's because he's basically gathering a lot of the superheroes that are out there and bringing who he can to this particular fight. But the reality of this is that this is just sort of a stopgap measure. You know what? This feels a lot like Infinity Gauntlet. That, that's one of the things that I was thinking when I was reading this. It feels a lot like Infinity Gauntlet, right? Like you have the main Infinity Gauntlet story, Thanos gets the gauntlet itself, and then basically uh, uh, Adam Warlock uses all the superheroes as cannon fodder in order to more or less distract Thanos to get him all arrogant and, and all that kind of good stuff. And in a moment of hubris, he would send the Silver Surfer in to steal the gauntlet and, and basically save the day, and it didn't work. But that really seems to be what's happening here, right? Because even Stephen Strange says that, you know, when he's being talked to by, by all these various individuals, uh, what, what's basically happening is it's kind of like, okay, so like these guys can't win, right? Like Carol Danvers cannot defeat Galactus and she never could. Uh, like Gladiator cannot defeat Galactus. None of these guys can defeat Galactus, the Incredible Hulk. I mean, there's no one here that would really stand a chance. But the way that Mark Wade does this is particularly interesting, right? Because one of the things that we get here is the voice of Black Bolt. Now, we kind of have to make the assumption that this takes place before the events of Death of Inhumans, right? Because during the Death of the Inhuman story, Black Bolt lost his voice. He can't do his quasi-sonic scream anymore. And so when he's like shouting and screaming at Galactus, letting it all out, Galactus is sort of stunned. And that does make sense. Mark Wade is, is running with Black Bolt, but also kind of ignoring the entire continuity as we've seen it before. Now, in truth, he can get away with it. I mean, people kind of give me a hard time for making fun of Black Bolt, but like he sucks. Uh, Black Bolt's powers back in the day, he used to be able to scream and like he could shatter planets with a scream, right? I mean, and the idea was like, like if he really, really belted, right? If he just, if he just like let that note fly, who knows what it was that he could achieve. But over the years in Marvel, his powers have basically been dropped off, right? I mean, the most powerful version of his character was actually in House of M when he whispered and like annihilated square miles of, of land, right? So when you're talking about him, like in the main Marvel universe, now, well, of course, he's far weaker than he ever was, you know, especially having lost his voice. But even before that, he was weaker than he was in the past. Uh, having this display of power, Black Bolt hasn't had this kind of power in a long, long time. So in terms of, of how this fits into continuity, I kind of feel like Mark Wade is sort of grabbing things and throwing it in. I think this is really done more for the purpose of just showing us how dire things are and the fact that, like, everybody's giving it their all. Uh, Black Bolt does a pretty decent job, but at the end of the day, he's defeated and consumed by Galactus just like every else. And that's when people really begin to, to panic here, because with Galactus consuming the power of Black Bolt and then having this sort of quasi-sonic scream, what it does is it starts emanating all this, this quasi-sonic energy out and just begins to sort of ripple and, and affect the boundaries of, of science and magic, right? So it's like it's like basically a, shatter, a shattering glass, right? If Black Bolt were to like scream and shatter a planet, that's basically what's happening with the barriers between these magical dimensions and reality itself, right? Because normally everything's compartmentalized. Normally like yeah, I mean, we kind of use the example of a house pretty consistently when it comes to the uh, when it comes to these you know dimensions and things like that. But if the house, if if a house is like the main Marvel universe, and like the closet is Asgard, and like the master bedroom is you know the dark dimension where Dormammu resides and all that kind of stuff, normally those doors are always closed. And so long as those doors are closed, no dimension can bleed into the other. What Galactus has done here is blown the doors off, right? So it's just like everything's just bleeding into everything else, right? It's just it's it's just mixed mixing iodine or mixing like a dye with water, everything just kind of jumbles all together. And so what you end up getting here is, is the character of Gladiator jumping in. Now, Kellark, in reality, should never stand a chance against Galactus. He's powerful, but he ain't that powerful. Classic Kellark is, like classic Kellark from back in the day, uh, probably from, yeah, from, from back in the day, like in the 80s and the 90s, he was very powerful. These days, not really. And that's one of the things that you see. And, and in reality, if, if Death of the Inhumans hadn't happened, I would look at this and say, I think that what Mark Wade is doing is trying to bring the characters back to the roles they had before they lost a lot of their power. Uh, and, and that kind of seems to be the case here. But again, we're, I, I think we're really just kind of looking at it from the perspective of like things are popping off and this is how crazy it is, right? But because of everything that's going on, the, the, the Shi'ar Imperial Guard, basically the special forces group that, that Kalark leads, the Gladiator leads, they all kind of go charging in. All these characters all go charging in. And for the most part, it doesn't really make any difference at all. None of it really matters. And that's when we end up learning the plan of 
of Doctor Strange that much like uh, much like Adam Warlock from Infinity Gauntlet, what Doctor Strange has come to the realization of is that given enough time, Galactus will, will seem, it seems like he will destroy himself. The problem is we don't know exactly how that will play out, right? Because you're, you're talking about uncharted territory here. You're talking about a cosmic entity who's left the main Marvel Universe, gone into a, into a magical dimension, and is essentially consuming everything, right? I mean, like, all the superheroes are, for the most part, in the process of being consumed, right? Like, Dormammu's sister is being consumed, the Incredible Hulk, all these guys, they're all being consumed by Galactus if they have any real uh, power of measure that Galactus can use to bolster his own abilities, right? He's essentially gone insane. And so with, with Doctor Strange running up on him, he basically comes to the realization that what Galactus is doing, he's, he's, it's like he's overeating, right? He's reaching critical mass, because remember, Galactus is pure energy. And so what's been going on here is that with him absorbing all this energy, he's reaching an unstable state. He's basically reaching a point by which he'll just kind of explode with all this energy going outward. There's no indication of what'll happen next. And so Doctor Strange running up on him goes to attack him. And when he seemingly injures Galactus, or at the very least appears to destroy him, what results is that everything is seemingly wiped away. The Doctor Strange is just stuck out in this kind of white void of everything with no clue what it is that he's done or how bad he screwed everything up. It's really cool. Like, I'm, I'm really, really digging this. Okay, so I am currently in a hotel right now, and the reason why I'm in a hotel will be made apparent on my vlogging channel. But uh, we are recording the audio for Doctor Strange. And technically, I'm supposed to be on vacation. Like, really, I, I am. But, like, you know, the video I had scheduled came out today. So, in the, the last video on Doctor Strange, we had talked about how, like, Galactus had basically consumed Dormammu, right? Like, he had basically, like, taken over the energies of Dormammu uh, and then sucked him into himself, right? And this basically elevated Galactus to, like, a whole new level of power, right? He was essentially, like, god level. And it was almost, it's, it's kind of interesting. If there was an eternity for the, the magical dimension, right? For all the, the space that makes up the various magical dimensions, then it would have been Galactus after he had consumed that. He was just so astronomically powerful. And so the result was that Doctor Strange channeled all of his magical energy into a single hit and then attacked Galactus. And when he did, the belief was that he destroyed everything. But what ended up happening is instead, he was met with this giant white void. Now, at that point, he's met with the living embodiment of eternity. And this is, under normal circumstances, not supposed to happen. And here's the reason why. Eternity is in and of itself the answer to the question, what if like all the life in the universe, everything that represented all life could get up and walk around? That would be eternity. And so in a giant white void, when there is essentially nothing, eternity should not exist. But Doctor Strange exists, therefore eternity is a reflection of Doctor Strange. He's, he's basically a reflection of existence. Now, you would think eternity would take the form of Doctor Strange if that were the case, and if it chose to, it could. Um, but eternity has its own form, and that's the reason why he appears the way he does. But what it asked Stephen Strange is, what in the heck happened here? And the response of Stephen was to basically say, well, the belief was that, that Galactus would be destroyed. And one, it would be the end of him in the main Marvel Universe. And two, it would bring an end to all the magical threat that exists out there and like all these crazy magical dimensions where Galactus was going nuts. What, what Eternity ends up revealing to Stephen Strange is that's not what happened. Instead, what took place is that what Stephen Strange did was essentially destroy the universe and then reset it. There's this tiny little singularity at the very beginning of everything, right? It's, it's essentially like it's frozen in a moment, like it's frozen in time for a second. But what's basically happening here is Stephen Strange hit Galactus, destroyed Galactus, Galactus imploded, sucked everything in on himself, and basically gave birth to like a new universe. And so this is kind of the moment before the universe explodes in the Big Bang and becomes something wholly new. And that's kind of a big deal because the question that's asked here is how did that happen, right? Like how did we get to that point where it ended up being like Doctor Strange who reset everything and that's when we end up, or at least Doctor Strange seems to indicate that it was the intention of Mephisto, right? It was the, the grand plan of Mephisto to essentially reset all of reality. But then we end up finding out that's not true. That's not what Mephisto wanted. That Mephisto's realm of hell resides on souls, right? I mean, we've talked about that before, but for those of you guys who are new here, Mephisto is kind of a stand-in for Satan, or at least he was until until Al Ewing introduced the one below all in the Incredible Hulk comics. Um, but Mephisto was kind of this being who would basically trick people, right? So like he would come to you in a time of need, in a time of dire, and say, I can help you out of this situation. I can give you what you want. All I'm going to do is ask for something in return. And if you choose to barter with him, two things will happen. The first is that you'll get what you want, but then you'll get something that handicaps it. You'll say like, man, like, you know, I really wish I had like a million dollars. I'm in, I'm in desperate need of like being able to pay off my house or something along those lines. And so Mephisto would give you the money to have your house paid off. And then as soon as your house is paid off, it'd be like destroyed to storm. And then the other thing is when you die, he'll take your soul. He's a pretty bad guy. <laughs> Having said that, he's also supremely powerful. But like appearing here to Stephen Strange and just being like, you screwed everything up. You destroyed Galactus. You screwed everything up. This fraction of a moment when Mephisto ended up yanking Doctor Strange to his realm, Mephisto is far more powerful than Doctor Strange. And that's the reason why 
Stephen Strange doesn't really cause any any beef with Mephisto, right? I mean, under any normal circumstance, if Mephisto had been away from his own realm long enough, like Doctor Strange could start some stuff. And so what ends up happening is Mephisto kind of turns to him and says, well, you know, he starts to think and he says, well, if you had the ability to basically fix the universe, would you do it? And Doctor Strange says yes. And this is important because Doctor Strange had made a deal with Mephisto. He'd made a pact with him. He would seek help from Mephisto to free Umar and, and Clea, who Mephisto had taken, you know, when Galactus was going crazy. Doctor Strange made a barter with Mephisto that, hey, I'll come calling for a favor later on. And in return, I will release Clea and, and Umar at the moment. And so that's what, that's exactly what Mephisto did. And so this seems to basically be the, the request being made by Mephisto is fix everything. And so it was kind of crazy because when that happens, Stephen Strange says, well, I can't just do it willy nilly because there's judges out there. There's people that, that want to make sure that the cosmic balance is being maintained. And that's when you're met by the arrival of the Living Tribunal. And this is kind of a cool thing because under normal circumstances, the Living Tribunal would probably look at this and say, I see no error here, right? In terms of like what happened, a conflict broke out and it being attained an insane amount of power. And with the destruction of that being came the birth of a new universe. It's the natural order of things. And so the result of this is that the Living Tribunal initially seeks to, to ask Doctor Strange, what's your motivation behind this? Like, are you going to recreate the universe and then fancy yourself a god? Or are you going to recreate the universe as it was? And of course, what he ends up saying is, I'm going to recreate it as it was. And the reason why is because if Stephen Strange decided to make himself a god, like make himself the god of the universe, he would stand side by side with eternity. That's magical imbalance. It's a mystical imbalance in the universe, and the Living Tribunal would never allow that to happen. In the exact same way that when Adam Warlock sought to become, uh, when he got the Infinity Gauntlet at the end of the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, and he sought to rule alongside eternity, that the Living Tribunal said, this is a cosmic imbalance. You cannot have two absolute beings in the universe, right? You can't have two supreme beings in the universe. It doesn't work that way. You can only have one. And that's exactly what the Tribunal says. You can do what you want to do. Like, you can fix the universe. Just make sure that everything goes back exactly the way that it was before. And that's exactly what ends up happening. It's kind of a crazy thing because what's basically going on here is Stephen Strange destroyed the universe and then remade it. The difference here is that he's remaking it exactly the way that it was before. Now, the reality is, is if I'm being honest here, it's not really a letdown for me. It's not really a disappointment for me. And the reason why is because what you basically get is this this kind of, it's, it's really more of like a focus on, on Stephen Strange, right? Like the price that Stephen Strange has to pay for, for the magic that he wields and the, and the role he plays, which is the, the biggest undertaking he's ever seen, basically recreating all of existence. Now, if this was a big crossover event, then I'd be pissed. I'd be mad because I'd be like, well, this is just a lazy way to end it, right? It's just a really lazy way to end the event. But for me, it's not really a lazy way to end the story. It's basically saying that like Stephen Strange is the Sorcerer Supreme. This is his job. It's his job to do things like this. And so to me, that's why it works because it's the nature of his character. I think it works. I think it fits in perfectly. One of the other cool things that comes out of this is remember, like when it comes to, to the universe, it has to be made perfectly, which means necessity. And so this basically means the return of all these dark beings, Thanos, Mistress Death, like all these terrible characters who have existed over the years and done and, and committed heinous acts. And so it was kind of a cool little moment because when that happens, you basically have him having to like relive his life, like relive all his past mistakes. The fact that he was, he was an amazing surgeon, the fact that his arrogance got the better of him, that he accidentally drove off a cliff. He ended up losing the ability to use his hands and then he became the Sorcerer Supreme. He has to go back and relive all these mistakes he made, all these battles that he fought. And it'd be very, very easy for him to kind of go back and say, well, you know, maybe I didn't drive off a cliff, you know, or maybe I, my arrogance didn't get the better of me, or, you know, this, maybe this happened, maybe that happened, something along those lines. Maybe I can make Spider-Man's life a little bit better. But the issue is who knows what effect it'll have on, on the universe. What he's basically doing here, because he's molding it, any change he makes will affect this universe. It won't create a branch off universe. It will affect the future of this universe. And so if he decided not to fly off the bridge, and if he decided that he basically went on to continue to become an amazing surgeon, then it could create like this totally bleak and dark future where everything is ruled by Baron Mordo. Who knows what kind of reality that would possess. Instead, what he does is he goes back to this moment when you ended up having Zolas show up and, and basically initiate this whole thing, right? Because remember, it was Zolas who showed up after Galactus had basically, you know, threatened his planet or at least was believed to be on the way to consume his planet. And then in turn, like it was Doctor Strange being a little haughty, being a little arrogant, and then like Zolas taking off and then whisking Galactus into the magical dimension that led to all this in the first place. And so what he does is he casts an enchant uh, enchantment spell onto Zolas and basically says like, this is the nature of the beast. Like you are now contained. And instead of being the person that says like, well, sorry about your luck, man. There's really nothing you can do, you know, and, and kind of putting Zolas in a position to where he, he was desperate and believed that he just had to get rid of Galactus in order to make it work. Instead, Stephen Strange reasons with him. And notice this, this is actually kind of a cool concept. One of the things he says here is he says that whenever it was a Galactus showed up on earth, that he was always sent away, but no two circumstances ever worked the same. Now, that is true to a degree, but the, the ultimate nullifier kind of flies in the face of that, right? The ultimate nullifier being this device that anything you pointed 
at and pull the trigger on, uh, it'll basically kind of wipe it from existence as if it was never there in the first place, right? And so, but for the most part, they're right. Whenever Galactus shows up and, and tries to consume the world, it's always a different reason for why he ends up leaving. And so that's basically what it is that, that, that Doctor Strange tells him is he says, there was one point where Galactus showed up to a planet called Zenla and basically consumed, or at least was going to consume the world until a guy named Norn Rad chose to become Galactus's herald. And instead he would basically seek out worlds and Galactus would spare his. And so that's the statement that he really makes to Zolas is this is really the only option you have to basically surrender yourself, to become Galactus's new herald, spare your world, but go forward helping him find other worlds. Following his meeting with the Living Tribunal and Eternity, both of whom approve of what it, of the work he's done, the fact that everything's back to normal and it's essentially like nothing ever happens at all, he's suddenly whisked away by Mephisto. And this is when we get to like the really duplicitous side of Mephisto, right? Because what he says is, no, 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 you still owe me a favor. And when Stephen Strange says, yeah, but I remade the universe just like you asked, Mephisto says, I, I never actually asked you to do that. I never actually made that a request. I simply presented the situation to you. And that's how Mephisto works. You have to be very meticulous in terms of what he says and how he says it. At no point in his dealings with Doctor Strange did he say, then I'm asking you to read, to, to fix the universe. I'm asking you to set everything back to the way that it was before. He never did that. You know, because of that, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Mark Wade sort of yanks the Spider-Man one more day chain. In this scenario, uh, what he basically says is, I want a fraction of a soul. Like I, I want a fraction of a soul that exists out there. And so it's kind of crazy because while we're not really explicitly told what it is, what it seems to be is a fraction of Clea's soul, right? Like the ex-wife of Stephen Strange. Because when he shows up there, he basically asks her, like, do you believe there's a chance for us to start over? Do you believe there's a chance for us to find romantic happiness once again? And Clea's like, absolutely I do. I've always thought about that. Why are you asking me? And he's like, because I was hoping you would give me a different answer. And then basically he zaps her mind, like white wipes away her memories of him. She has no idea who Stephen Strange is. Now, in reality, if you're not a fan of Stephen Strange, this moment will pass without any real measure of, of value. You'll just kind of be like, okay, I mean, I guess that's the thing. But if you are a fan of Stephen Strange, I don't know how you'll take it, whether you'll be mad or whether you'll be happy. I honestly don't really care. Clea never really interested me that much in the first place, but it is kind of interesting. I imagine for hardcore Doctor Strange fans, this is like a Spider-Man one more day kind of thing. Um, Just not as, as, you know, as impactful or as big because Doctor Strange isn't Spider-Man. But still, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting moment because it's basically Doctor Strange going back to the path of being alone, going back to the path of just of it just being him and nobody else. It's intriguing here. It's really, really interesting. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.